Welcome to What's Cooking. There's one seat left just for you. Today's class, another fall baking theme, but we're gonna do a pumpkin pound cake with a walnut sauce, and we're gonna do caramel apple cookies. Fantastic and great for parties. We're gonna start out with the pumpkin pound cake with the walnut sauce. And John is gonna show you how to grease and flour a large bunt pan if you're not familiar with this technique at all, or if you try to take shortcuts and your cake always sticks. I'm on. I have my glasses on yes. today so this that I This is not a substitute with me. This is actually John in glasses. That's so I can read this recipe later. Great. You finally trusted me enough to, to let me do my own recipe, yeah. right? You're a big boy now. Grease that pan. Right? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can use a paper towel like I'm doing on the, on the cylinder here. And you can also use, which I'll use for the uh, dented portion, a basting brush. And Bev, it's going to take a little while, so if you want to... Well, I was going to mention something um, about the fact that this is a non-stick... This is a non-stick pan that they can now see. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is a non-stick pan. But still you want to grease and flour. It just makes life so much easier. Uh, you go through all the trouble to make a good cake and you want it to just come out um, as soon as you're done with it. And the brush really helps get into the grooves, doesn't it? Helps you get into the groove, right. that's right. <laughs> it does, it helps get down into those little uh, indentations which is difficult to do with uh, when you're using paper or wax, either wax paper or uh, paper towel. Now you would use the same technique for a layer cake? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, in fact, uh, one of the reasons you do this, and you want it as thin a layer as you can, but you want it totally covered so that the uh, flour will adhere to it. But the, the real reason you do this is so that no chunks stick to the pan and, and uh, then you have a not, a not a nice looking cake. Now I'll really put you on the spot and tell people that once he adds the flour to it and shakes it around and disperses any excess flour, you should see a nice even flour coating. If you see some pan through it, then you know that you haven't greased that part enough and you need to go back and grease it. Well, I think you're really putting me on the spot here. I am. So this better be, this better be good, a top-notch right? job. Okay. Well, you have your glasses on now, so it <laughs> shouldn't be any problem. I'll be able to see those spots that I left. Okay. Uh, I like to start by pouring flour uh, down the middle part, the tube. That kind of gets that covered and it also deposits That's a good idea. I some don't flour do down. I well, should pay attention. That's, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. Now you kind of turn it and pound on it and the flour comes around. And uh, I'll probably get it all over the deck here, but that's all right, because it does clean up. And once you get it all the way around like this, then I'm going to step over to the sink and pound on it for a second, get it out. He wants to get all that excess out. Make a big racket. Now we have a nice even coating, like so. Perfect. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's make the pumpkin pound cake next. This is a great hearty pound cake. Uh, it's large, as you can see by the size of the bunt pan that John has greased and floured. It's a 12 cup capacity. It freezes very well, so if you want to make this ahead for the holidays or just to have on hand if you have unexpected guests, it's great to do that too. Um, I'm going to start out by creaming one and a half cups of unsalted butter that's already been softened with two and three quarters cups of sugar. And John, do you want to start your walnut sauce? Or? Sure. Uh, in this saucepan, I'm going to put a cup of firmly packed brown sugar. The reason for packing it that way is because otherwise you wouldn't be able to uh, have recipes be consistent from one cook to another get a lot of air pockets in it. Exactly. A uh, quarter cup of dark corn syrup. I 
want to mention something. If you have a stand mixer, one of the biggest complaints that we hear a lot is people put things in their mixer and then they turn it on and everything flies out. Well, usually they don't start it on stir or a slow speed and you need to make sure you do that. Otherwise, yes, things will fly all over the place. Half a cup of whipping cream. Two tablespoons of butter. And a dash of salt. I'll show you, I don't know if you can see this on camera. Uh, this is uh, Grandma Schaefer's way of telling a dash. Uh, a pinch is like a, you know, a little bit of salt between two fingers. A dash is when it covers up the grooves in your hand. So that's a dash by my grandmother's definition. In a recipe, when it calls for creaming the butter and the sugar, what you're basically doing is combining the two and making them light. And also, you're dissolving the sugar a little bit, which helps in the final product. Okay, I took one of John's uh, measuring spoons. That's because you're right-handed. Definitely. And actually, we're on different sides uh, from each you're other. You're on my side. <laughs> right. Okay. One teaspoon of vanilla to this cake. Excuse me. Bless you. And six eggs. And remember, we've mentioned before, keep track of your quantity of eggs by keeping your egg shells until you're all done. And any time a recipe calls for eggs, use large eggs, unless it specifies otherwise. That's really what they're asking for. And when you go into the grocery store, let me start these up a little bit. And you want to check the egg carton and make sure all the eggs are fresh and none are broken. Just take your fingers and run them across and they should all move slightly. If they don't, you know the one's broken on the bottom. That's why you do that. That's why I do that. We thought I was just uh, playing with the eggs. <laughs> Okay, two more. I'm trying to get this sauce to boil. As soon as it boils, I'll turn it down to simmer for five minutes. And then after it's simmered for five minutes, we're going to add some vanilla and the walnuts. We used to say, when we were looking for good recipes, that there were certain ingredients that you could tell a recipe had a chance of being good. And one of them was brown sugar, right? Well, this has brown sugar. <laughs> yes, yeah, sour cream was another one. This has uh, cream, butter. Walnuts. It's walnuts bound to be good. It's got to be good. And it is. Okay, every time you do any kind of a batter mixing, you want to stop at some point and scrape down the beater and the sides of the bowl. Is it true about the uh, washed pot never boils? Definitely. I shouldn't look at it then? Don't look at it. Okay, in this bowl I have a mixture of three cups of unbleached flour, some baking powder, some salt, cinnamon, ginger, and cloves. Kind of like a pumpkin pie in the spice area. And then I'm going to add one cup of canned pumpkin, which is eight ounces, and um, scrape this into there too. Now you want to add this alternately. You want to do some dry and some of the pumpkin. It incorporates better into your final product, and that's really why you do it. I'm going to borrow this, John. You may have that. Thank you. Have you ever said anything about unbleached flour and why we like to use it? Um, and salt, unsalted If butter? I have, it's probably been a while, and so it's worth repeating. Okay. Um, 
in general, or the bottom line is unbleached all-purpose flour is superior to bleached flour in flavor. And so we use it as our everyday flour, all-purpose unbleached flour. And uh, if you want to get real technical, we like Montana Sapphire, which is a type of wheat. Uh, cake flour has uh, a different consistency and bread flour is different also. But for, you know, everyday use, cakes, pies, etc., cetera, uh, and some breads, we use unbleached all-purpose flour because it does taste better. And then we like to use unsalted or sweet butter for a couple of different reasons. Again, the taste. You can control the quantity of salt in your recipes. Um, I think the jury is still out as to how good margarine really is for you as a substitute. And, um, and just purely chemically, baking-wise, salted butter burns faster than unsalted or sweet butter. So if you're not baking and gorging yourself every day, treat yourself to the best ingredients, I think. It'll make your final product well worth it. Okay, if you can look over here for a second. I do have this boiling. I'm going to turn it down. Do I need to uh, stir it while it's simmering, Beth? No. Okay, didn't think so. Set a timer for five minutes. So you're almost making a caramel sauce there, aren't you? Mm-hmm. I wanted to get back to uh, what you were talking about, Bev, because I think it really gets to our philosophy of what we call good cooking. You can call it gourmet cooking if you want. But it starts with, number one in importance, being a good recipe. And believe me, there's a lot of bad recipes out there. Number two in importance is good ingredients. And that's why we talk about unsalted butter and, and uh, uh, the kinds of flours to use and making your own vanilla and things like that. And number three is technique. And that's what we try to show you in these classes is the techniques that kind of help make it easier. Uh, technique and equipment can make cooking easier but if you don't have the first two parts of that, a good, a good recipe and good ingredients, you're in trouble. End of sermon. Speaking of technique, you know, since I'm so used to being on that side, I feel like a fish out of water. Do you? Yeah. Not me. I'm comfortable anywhere. Are you? Well, excuse me. <laughs> Okay, we're almost finished with this. Again, it's a little bit of a slow process, but because of the volume, you want to take your time. It'll incorporate better. You'll have a better end product. We should really call this three quarters of a pound cake because it only has three quarters of a pound of butter in it. Don't tell them that. <laughs> If I could uh, focus your attention over on this pot one more time, I want to talk a little bit about uh, quality uh, cookware. Uh, cookware and cutlery are two very important parts of, of the equipment that you should have in your kitchen. And one of the things that a good pan does, which this one is, it has a copper inlaid base and it's stainless steel on the cooking surface, is distributes the heat evenly. And if you can see how the bubbles are, are bubbling, they're, they're very uniform throughout the whole pan. And that's important in lots of things, and especially a sauce like this. And you're uh, beating and beating, huh? This is ready, and uh, how about if you help me put this in the pan? Sure. We'll set the uh, beater over there later for licking. <laughs> How about if I hold that? Okay. What I like to do is, is put uh, a portion in, like so, and then turn the pan. 
and just kind of work my way around. Is that my cue? That's your cue. Looks great. Mm -hmm. That uh, creaming process with the butter and the sugar, I think, makes a lighter, fluffier batter. I can pound that, John, on the counter. Okay. Okay, if you want to even that out, excuse me, tastes good. Do that a couple of times. Get some of the air pockets out. That also wakes up the audio department. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to stick this in the oven now. This is. Hello. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> this is very dense, so it's going to take 60 to 70 minutes to bake. That was my timer. And let's see if I can find a rack here. And it is ready to have a little uh, walnuts added to it. Vanilla. And vanilla. Oh, sorry. Thank you. The reason you add vanilla at the end is? So it doesn't cook out. So you Anytime you add vanilla or anything that has alcohol or liquor in it, um, it will cook out if you add it during the boiling process. It maximizes the flavor. Stir that in. Stir in the nuts. And we just eat it right out of the bowl. Okay. <laughs> Where's the ice cream when we need it? That's right. Okay, why don't you put that on the back burner? Literally. Okay. <laughs> that was and a bad pun. I know. I couldn't help it though. The next recipe we're going to do is just a lot of fun. It is very rich, it tastes great. It's great for a Halloween party. It would be great for dessert for Thanksgiving. And it would be absolutely wonderful on a cookie tray during the holidays. So we're gonna show you how to make caramel apple cookies. Can I start the caramels? Yeah, you start your caramel sauce. And okay. let me get you out part of your ingredients. John has in the pot up here um, 30 caramels that are unwrapped. Make sure you unwrap them. I didn't put that in the recipe, but make sure you unwrap them. And two tablespoons of apple juice concentrate that's simply been thawed and two tablespoons of water. That's going to be the coating for the cookies. So he's going to start cooking that, and I'll show you how to make the cookie dough. There's the apple juice. I need that. Thank okay. You. Get a little water. One. Okay, the basic uh, cookie dough. This is a lot like Mexican tea cookies. Have you ever made those? Except they have some apple juice concentrate in them. Somehow we have no quarter cup measure. I mean, we have everything else. Well, how about if I? Uh that would be wonderful. Get you one here. Okay. Powdered sugar, butter, and apple juice concentrate. Three quarters of a cup of powdered sugar. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. And have your butter at room temperature so it's nice and soft. Okay, the cookie dough, we have three quarters of a cup of powdered sugar, and we're going to need two thirds of a cup of butter. So I'll just measure this out. Take a third and a third. And John, you devised this, this stick. Measurement. This measurement stick. Device. Mm -hmm. How about if you talk about sure. it? Sure. It's really handy. Actually, it's just a ruler that uh, on the back happened to be 
uh, blank. So we just took one of those little pieces of paper wrappers off a, off a stick of butter and measured one, one through eight tablespoons. And it also says a half a cup for the full, which, you know, is probably worthless and a quarter cup for half. But the one third of a cup comes in very handy, especially for, uh, for that kind of a, a job. And it, it is critical sometimes to have the exact amount of butter fat in a, in a given recipe. So this does come in handy once in a while. Well, the wrapper never seems to be put on just right, so right. it helps. I need to take out a patent on that. You do. So just speaking of a watched pot, cooking stuff. I was just right going to say caramels. that caramels do take a while to melt, no question about it. Could you hand me a spatula for scraping? Right. How about that? Thank you. Okay, to this we're now going to add one and a half cups of flour. quarter of a teaspoon of salt. And that's basically our cookie dough. We're going to combine this till it holds together. I'll be back with you in a while. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see you in the next show, right? Right. A little house cleaning? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Oh, we're so polite, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for something to do anyway. Let's melt those caramels. I'm trying. Scrape this down along the sides, too. A little bit more mixing, and this should be just about right. It's important in this recipe that you get all the dry ingredients incorporated because otherwise when you're rolling the cookies, what will happen is you'll get some parts that won't work very well for you because they're too dry. This looks perfect. Now, how can you tell when it's perfect? You want to take and you want to be able to just squeeze the dough together. And if it holds like that without seeing any dry flour. It's perfect. I'm making some progress over here. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so by the time you have those cookies all out and baked, <laughs> <You'll be done. laughs> I'll be done. Air mixing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A couple of different ways to do these cookies. You can simply take a couple of teaspoons, dunk it in, and roll them together. We find the easiest use is um, a scoop. We use this for any kind of a drop cookie or a ball cookie. We also use it for meatballs. It really comes in handy. So you want to fill the scoop flat, put the dough in your hand, and roll it into a nice even ball. Now, besides speed and ease of use, you get nice uniform cookies. So if you have kids and they fight over who gets the larger cookie, or big kids that fight over that, 
then you don't have to worry. Now, John, since you're um, frantically melting the caramels over there, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell a story about you. Okay. A long time ago, when I used to read the uh, women's magazines during the holidays, and uh, so they could make you feel guilty about all the things you should do for your family during the holiday season. There was one article about what you should do is bake all your holiday cookies ahead. Well, you're not telling this story. Yes, I am. <laughs> Stick them in the freezer, have them all labeled, and then you'll have plenty of time to spend with your family during the holidays. And your family will appreciate that you took the time to make, to make cookies from scratch. Well. And we did. And we did. And I stuck them in the freezer, all labeled and ready to go. Went down there about a week before Christmas, opened up about three tins, and they were completely empty. <laughs> John had eaten his favorite cookies. Mexican tea cakes? Mexican tea cakes. What did I tell oh, you, a giant gorilla? Yeah, something Kim? like that. Ate them all. But you appreciated it. You yes, just, I did, every one of them. You just appreciated it at the wrong time. <laughs> Needless to say, I don't make cookies ahead I've anymore. matured, too. Yeah. I've matured. <laughs> How are you doing over there? Well, we're uh, about half done here. Okay. I'm melting rapidly. Now these How are will you doing? I'm doing just great. These will spread a little bit when you bake them. And as soon as they come out of the oven, they take 12 to 17 minutes to bake. What you want to look for, you'll start to see that the edges start to get a little bit golden. And then you know they're done. As soon as they come out of the oven, take a flat toothpick and stick it in the cookie. And then let them cool completely. The cookie will be real soft when you take it out of the oven, so you'll stick the toothpick in. And then later, when you're decorating and picking them up to eat, the toothpick will hold the cookie in place. So that would be the equivalent of one tray. And say they would, we'll use our imagination here, come out of the oven. Give me the box of toothpicks, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Make sure you use flat toothpicks. Stick the fat end right down in the middle. Then you're all set. And this makes probably close to two dozen cookies, one batch of dough, and you can always double it. Where did you go? I'm gone. <laughs> Why don't you bring back those cookies that we're going to ice so you can show what they look like? Sure. Or are you ready to do that? I'm ready. Once they're baked, mm -hmm. once they're baked, they look like this. And slightly light golden around the edges. Toothpick in there nice and firm. And these are all ready to decorate. And I'm going to get my plate of walnuts ready. Okay. Uh, this does show what Bev was talking about, how the, uh, the cookie sticks to the toothpick after it's cooled. And that makes it uh, a lot easier when we go to put this melted caramel on. And it makes it look like candy apples. That's right. Caramel apples. Okay, this is about three quarters of a cup of finely chopped walnuts. You want to put them on a plate like this. So that after the caramel topping goes on, you can put it on the plate right away and kind of smooth, spoon it around the edges. Why don't we, um, can you get out my little ladle that I use to, to do that? And I think I'm ready to, whoops, I'm ready to drop the ladle. I'm ready to do one. It's not, you know, I can get a little bit out here. It's not quite as done as I would like it to be. Well, it's okay, take but your it's, time. It's done enough that I can do it if you want. Sure, are you going to melt another minute? Maybe we can get a cam car Maybe we can get a shot, a camera shot of that. And you want it just nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. So we're close. 
Probably if I wouldn't stir it so much, it would d get done faster. Huh? Not really. One of the things that John commented on in this recipe is the apple juice concentrate makes it taste a little bit like a liqueur on the on the topping. It's really a good cookie. Very rich. As you can tell from the ingredients. But it does give it a nice rich flavor, the uh, the actual caramel. And I think it softens it somehow, the, the combination of the water and the uh, apple juice uh, softens it so it's... Uh, a smoother glaze. A, sm a nice glaze, yeah. Definitely. Well, this is uh, just about there. Okay. There's still a few little pieces in there, but I can show the process if you would like me to. Sure. Of how to do it. Might want to move that plate up just a tiny bit. You get it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's get a little bit more. There we go. Now, when these come out of the oven, they would be on a cooling rack. And if you do this process, you'd want to have some wax paper underneath the cooling rack to catch all the caramel drippings. And then you can use a spoon. You can simply press it down in there. How about uh, an extra plate? Mm -hmm. Do you want another one? Yeah, do another one. Okay. I'm going to show them the technique one more time. You want to do it on a rack? No. No, that's fine. And I did a better job on that one. Wonderful. The learning curve works. <laughs> if you. Um, if the caramel gets too hard while you're doing it, just put it back on the heat, heat it mm -hmm. up a little bit. If it starts to get too thick, you can add oh, a little bit more water and mix it in uh, a quarter tablespoon, a quarter teaspoon at a time. Okay. Great. Okay, we'll show you a finished plate of those. This is what they look like when they're all decorated and cooled. And how about if we serve you a slice of the pumpkin walnut pound cake with the walnut sauce. Okay, then we'll take the slice out. Yeah, that looks great. That's a nice moist cake. Mm -hmm. And we'll put a little sauce on it. Let me turn this so everybody can see how good that looks. Okay. And that's the walnut caramel sauce, we'll mm -hmm. call it, that you made before. Where's my fork? Two really great fall desserts. Both for fun, both for company, both for your family. Enjoy them. That's it for today. Stop in again and find out what's cooking. See ya.